we've been talking about encountering God in Scripture. We've been talking about our experiences of Jesus in Scripture. I think for a lot of people, when they're reading the majority of the scriptural texts, they're not seeing things that are directly connected to their lives, right? They're seeing stories from thousands of years ago. They're seeing lists of rules. They're seeing poetry that maybe is talking about nations that they don't even, they're not even familiar with. Uh, it's important for us to recognize that there are different senses in which we read scripture, right? That it's not just going to be the obvious meaning on paper. So can you talk to me a little bit about that? <laughs> can I talk to you a little bit about that? I don't know, because this is something I like to talk a lot about. Love it. Okay, so maybe we need an easy entry point to think about this, to think about senses of scripture. What does that mean? What do you mean I read scripture in different yeah. senses? Okay, so we've thought about the Bible as a book, and we've thought about the Bible as a place of encounter. So kind of what we're thinking about is how is the book a place of encounter? Like I'm reading a book, how is this a place of encounter? Right. How does that happen? Well, besides the Holy Spirit helping us, there are these senses. So I don't know if anyone's familiar with the Chronicles of Narnia. Love. Love the Chronicles of Narnia. I've heard it in my car about 8,500 8, times because my kids like to listen to it. But in the book, The Last Battle, which is the last of the Chronicles of Narnia, at least, Chronologically? Chronologically and as written. And as written. Yeah. Okay. Great. So This one people don't argue about. The last battle comes okay. last. Chronological <laughs> order or publication order. There's no confusion. No confusion. Okay. So at the end of the book, when the children enter into the real Narnia, right into heaven, there's this beautiful scene. I'm going to butcher it, but there's a beautiful scene in which the children are eating. And they realize like this food is delicious in a way that I never knew food could be delicious. One of the lines that I love is that the sweetest wild strawberry, right, that they had ever eaten now just seemed sour, right? This whole new experience of a strawberry. And this is what happens in the book when you enter into heaven. And C.S. Lewis uses this line constantly that you're going farther up and further in. So when we read scripture, the same thing happens, okay? We start with the text on the page, and then as we read according to these senses, we go, farther up and further in, right? We enter actually sort of into scripture as a world. You mentioned Gregory the Great before and this idea of scripture as a stream. He also has this picture of scripture as like a woods, right? Like that you actually enter into sort of also very Narnia-ish. <laughs> but to think about scripture as a text, as a book that you actually enter into the story, you enter into this world and things there are as the kids in Narnia experience them, right? So much more rich, so much more deep. A wild strawberry now just seems sour once you sort of find your way into this world. Exactly, and so you've got this literal sense, right? The author's intended meaning in which we have to read according to genre still, right? Because there might be things that they're saying that on the surface level seem to be intended in one way. And we say, okay, well, no, this first day of creation, the author is not trying to write us a history book, right? But you've got this, this literal sense, what is the author deliberately intending to right. communicate to us? Mm -hmm. But then we also have these spiritual senses. And that's an area where the Holy Spirit can really do some remarkable things in us, right? There's the allegorical sense that's mm -hmm. pointing forward to the realities of the New Testament of the church. So when you're reading about the manna, you know that literally there was bread from heaven that the people ate that sustained them. But allegorically, this is pointing forward to the Eucharist. Uh, but then we've also got the anagogical sense. Tell me about the anagogical sense. It's a big word, Katie. Yes. So anagogical is the sense of scripture that points us towards heaven, right? That points us towards the eternal things. So in some sense, it is an allegorical way of reading, right? So I always start with what's on the page, the literal, yeah. and it's my access to these deeper senses, right? To these spiritual senses. So I'm reading what's on the page, I see the words that are there, the story that's being told, and I'm able to then refer it to this sense of eternity, right? Of heaven, of what life in heaven with God is like. And so that's what the anagogical sense is in particular, right? So we've already got some layers. We've got our letter, we've got our allegorical sense, and we have our anagogical sense. And then we've got the moral sense. And this, I think, is where I spend the most time in reading scripture because the moral sense is really talking about 
the way that the text relates to you and your life. And this is where I think the Holy Spirit can do an incredible amount of work in us because there are, there are things that anybody could look at this text and say, clearly this is something the Lord is trying to communicate to us about the way that we need to follow him. And there are other things where it's really just the Holy Spirit speaking to me right now. I think about uh, Matthew 10, 29 to 31, which is a favorite passage of mine. It says, are not two sparrows sold for a small coin, yet not one of them falls to the ground without his father's knowledge. Even all the hairs on your head are counted. So do not be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. And I was feeling some feelings a couple years back. I was um, on my way into church and I went to the bathroom and I'm washing my hands and I look in the mirror and I, I saw some gray hairs that I hadn't noticed before. And you know, aging is a complicated thing, right? And aging when you are childless is complicated in like a whole different way. And I was like looking at these gray hairs and I was feeling all kinds of like, Lord, where is my life going? And like, like what, what is the end game here? And is there hope for these longings that I have in my heart? And just feeling very unseen and very abandoned. And I went in to make my holy hour and I had my spiritual director had given me a passage to read and it was mm -hmm. Matthew 10, 29 to 31. Mm -hmm. And reading, even all the hairs on your head are counted. When I had just had like an emotional breakdown over the hairs on my head, like in that moment and recognizing like Matthew Writing down those words of Jesus was not thinking like some childless lady is going to be feeling feelings about her gray hairs in 2000 years, but the Holy Spirit was thinking that, right? And the Holy Spirit giving me that consolation of saying, not just like vaguely God is thinking about you and he cares about you, but like, I know you were looking at those gray hairs and I need you to know that I see those gray hairs, right? And so that's, that's the sense for me in which I feel like obviously, you know, it has to be rooted in the teachings of the church and in the reality of what we know to be true about God, but the way that the Lord can speak in, in such particularity into mm -hmm. our lives. Mm -hmm. It is amazing how scripture can do that, right? right? So for me, these senses of scripture, they have been like the life <laughs> for me of even like having a sense of what scripture is or why I would read it, right? That, that you learn that there's this depth there so I don't even, I wouldn't even say that scripture is something that I at some point picked up and started reading. That might sound weird for someone who's making videos about reading the Bible to say, <laughs> but here's the thing. I came at it through the way in which all kinds of people from our tradition, from the earliest years of the church up until today say like, okay, so here's the letter on the page. And now I'm going to show you something really beautiful. If you read it allegorically, mm -hmm. I'm going to show you something really beautiful. If you read it anagogically and to have the, the scripture suddenly become something dynamic, right? Something that's sort of prismatic and that just opens up like that was like so astonishing to me. Like, wait, there's more here than what I've read a hundred times. There's more here than I've read, you know, Anytime I've ever picked up this Bible, now I read something new. And it's not that it wasn't there before, and it's not that God didn't mean for it to say that. It's that scripture is this timeless thing. And God, as its author, gives it this, this depth and this beauty that he invites you in. Like if we go back to Gregory the Great with his river, like to just be immersed in and just swim in and to just whatever is happening in your life, to, to be able to be fed and to be nourished by scripture, right? To see that God speaks to you even in this instance. So another way maybe that I like became familiar with scripture actually is that when I was a kid, so I'm the second oldest of seven kids. When I was a kid, somehow my parents rounded us all up at the end of the day and we would do night prayer. So the Psalms that come with night prayer are words and images and language that have been with me since I was like before I even knew I was hearing these words in this language, right? And so as you, as you grow with these images in this language, you hear them in different ways, right? So Psalm 91, for example, is the Psalm for Sundays, for night prayer on Sundays. And recently in life, I came through a diagnosis of cancer and all of the treatment for it. And that Psalm became something entirely new. Right? And, and this idea of taking refuge under the wings of God became an entirely new reality. And so that happens not just at Psalm 91, but all over scripture, right? So you quoted Matthew, 
And so the, the awareness that those depths are there and that scripture is a timeless thing that speaks to you, it's God speaking to you, should sort of open us up to this place of encounter that scripture really truly is, right? Matthew is a gospel. You have to know the genre. You have to know what you're reading. But as you read, you're sort of carried into, through the letter, you're carried into this whole world further up and farther in, mm -hmm. right? And you find yourself suddenly immersed in God's love and the way that that transfigures the world, right? Even the way you see God's always enlarging, deepening the world around you and yourself. And I think many of us have only really ever heard scripture explained in the literal sense. And it's hard to understand why we should care, even though it's the word of God, if it's just a series of stories and sermons from thousands of years ago. What what could this possibly mean for my life? And I think when I was first reading, you know, I, I was like, okay, well, I'm reading the Bible because I'm supposed to read the Bible, right? God wrote one book and I'm a know-it-all. So how am I going to know it all if I haven't read God's book, right? So I'm, I'm reading the Bible really only with this sense of this is, this is groundwork that was laid thousands of years ago and I should know it because people should know things. And once you start reading this, these spiritual senses, it is just this constant gasping, right? This, oh my goodness, mm. how did I never see that that was there before? Right? Whether it's the allegorical sense and you think, oh wow, this, this connects exactly to the passion and I never made that connection before and it's, and it's intellectually exciting or whether it's just the Lord speaking directly to your heart mm. through that moral sense and, and you say, this is, not, this is not just something that happened on a battlefield 3,000 years ago, right? This is the Lord telling me that I need friends standing beside me and holding up my arms so that I can be interceding, that, that the victory comes not through me going it alone, but God surrounding me by people who hold me up. Uh, there's, there's just always, there's always more. Mm -hmm. And I think for those who are watching who maybe you've tried reading scripture and you feel like you haven't gotten much out of that, again, so sympathetic to that. Uh, there are definitely weeks, months where I'm going through and I'm like, all right, Lord, this clearly has value. Otherwise you wouldn't have written it, but, but you're not speaking to me in this right now and that's okay. But approaching scripture using those, uh, those spiritual senses, I think is such an invitation beyond the, the factual knowledge to mm -hmm. the encounter. Yeah. I also think, so you're talking about parts of scripture that don't feel like they're speaking to me. I wonder if that's not a place where like thinking allegorically maybe is useful. Mm -hmm. Also because I remember in a previous video, you told us that the old is hidden in the new and the new is also hidden in the old, right? And that as Catholics, we need to read the Old Testament. Don't worry, I'm going somewhere with this, right? So the richness of things is that as I read the letter on the page and I think allegorically, I'm learning about God. I'm learning about Christ. I'm learning about the Holy Spirit, right? I'm, I'm, re I'm learning about this triune God who cares so much about me. So eventually, yes, I get to hear how it speaks to me, but I also need to be aware, and maybe this is in places where I don't feel like it's speaking to me, it's speaking about God, right? God's telling you about himself, this, this being who loves you so much. And so as you maybe you're finding those passages in the Old Testament, it's helping you then when you read the Gospels to see, oh, gasping, right? Mm -hmm. About who this person is, this incarnate word, right? This way that God has expressed his love for you by actually becoming a human being and having human experiences, right? So that, that level, that sense, the allegorical one can be one that we sort of tend to forget about because we're worrying about what's on the page, worrying about how is God speaking to me, but also the point is to know God himself. Yes. Know God yes. and know thyself is what Augustine says. So this allegorical sense, and even the anagogical one, right? These things that we hope for, what do they look like? Or what, what might I be allowed to imagine by thinking anagogically, um, right, about the future? So those senses too are very useful. And maybe when we're feeling kind of, as I say, dry, right? That I, I'm not feeling scripture so much, I can learn about God himself. Exactly. So again, it's just this invitation to enter into scripture, to give it a shot and to say, Spirit, I know that you are the one who wrote this text, and I know that you are alive, and I know that you are working in me. And if you've got something you want to say to me, then I praise you. And if not, I'm going to show up anyway, because I'm not, 
I'm not here for what I get out of this, right? It's, we don't read the Bible just because it's going to make us gasp, just because we're going to learn things, just because we're going to, we're going to have a, a beautiful revelation. We read scripture because God has revealed himself to us and, mm -hmm. and he deserves for us to engage with him in that way, even if we aren't getting butterflies from it. So <laughs> Another invitation to open your Bible, to spend some time with the Word of God, and to trust that if you're not understanding things, if you're not feeling things, God is still working. Right. And even, what if we said this, even when you open it up and you find something that is so difficult, that's also an invitation. Yes. Right? <laughs> things aren't always easy. In fact, some, sometimes that's why people feel intimidated by Scripture. They know there's difficult things in there. But those difficult things, right, that's sort of more where your elephant's coming through your river instead of your mouth, they're worth struggling with yes. because God's showing himself to you in those things. And to struggle to understand him is sort of the, the main struggle that's worth wrestling with, right? Absolutely. Come out the other side knowing God more deeply, then it's worth the struggle.